Thank you for checking out this movie review. This is for the 1985 film Reanimator. And yes, when I'm recording this, just yesterday was the 34th anniversary of Reanimator. So sorry I didn't get this out on the anniversary, but I got it out the day after, which I'm actually surprised I was able to do. Kind of hustled for it. So, Reanimator. Yes, so I own it obviously on DVD. This is a kind of like special edition. Um, Anchor Bay collection, which, by the way, like the Anna, like the hand drawn artwork on that just looks really good. But I didn't actually watch it on DVD. I watched it on Shutter because it's currently streaming on Shutter when I'm doing this review, so you can check it out there. Uh, and as you will note, it says H.P. Lovecraft's Reanimator because they are properly attributing this story to H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote the original story, obviously, called and it was called Herbert West's Reanimator. And they just shortened it to Reanimator. Uh, I had looked up and, oh yeah, uh, so H.P. Lovecraft on IMDb.com has 202 writing credits for films. Which is crazy because obviously he didn't live during the time of films, yet his stories are so good and last so long in the horror community that he has 202 writing credits in movies. It, it's insane. It's totally insane. But it's awesome. So... First of all, I want to do shout out to subscriber Uncle Pete, who has actually been asking me to do a reanimator review for many, many months. I told him some time ago, yes, I'll do it, and then I forgot. So then he asked me again, and I was like, sorry, I forgot. I will definitely do it this time. So uh, I'm definitely doing it now, and there you go, Uncle Pete. So anyway, let's talk about this, because I actually have a lot. This might be a long video, but I'm really breaking it down. Yes, there will be spoilers, so anyone who's watching this and you haven't seen it yet, go check out Reanimator, then come back. Highly recommend this movie. It is awesome. Um, yeah. Written and directed by Stuart Gordon, uh, who also did Castle Freak and From Beyond. Uh, produced by Brian Usna. Yes, the Brian Usna, who I believe both wrote and directed the film Society, uh, the 1980s wacky movie Society. If you have not seen Society, definitely see that. Those two, Stuart Gordon and Brian Usna, then worked together again to do Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Didn't see that one coming, did you? I know some people probably out there already knew that, but when I first found that out, I was like, wait, 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 wait. The guy who did Reanimator and the guy who did Society wrote the script for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Those things are very different. But that just highlights how it's not just about a niche market. Like, people have many talents. Because you're a writer or a filmmaker or a director or whatever doesn't mean that you can only do one genre. You can do plenty of genres, and this is a prime example of that. So like I said, it's, our, it's based on Herbert West's Reanimator story. Uh, obviously, the big draws to this film are Jeffrey Combs, who's become kind of a legend within the horror community for how he acts his roles. And the way he acts as Herbert West, he chews the scenery like nobody's business. He becomes kind of, a lot of people think of him as the main character in this, which he's actually not. It's main, It's supposed to be uh, the character Dan Kane in this is supposed to be the main character played by Bruce Abbott. Yes, Bruce Abbott. But funny enough... Uh, Herbert, uh, Herbert West, uh, Jeffrey Combs as Herbert West and Barbara Crampton as, um, Megan Halsey are the two people who kind of come out of this film and go on to have way more success than the guy who was supposed to be the, the focus of this film, Bruce Abbott. So it's kind of funny that like Bruce Abbott is the titular role and people love this film, but everyone's just like, if you said to a lot of people, oh yeah, Bruce Abbott, even people who like love reanimator, they'd be like, who? But if you say Jeffrey Combs or you say Barbara Crampton, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're, the way they acted is way more, like, it's way better. I, I think the part of the problem is Bruce Abbott was playing more of, like, the straight man. And in comparison to how Barbara Crampton did in a very challenging role and how Jeffrey Combs did in a role that uh, is just very complicated. Like, he just brought so much to that role and makes you kind of feel a range of emotions about Herbert West. And that, you know, that's partially the writing, but it's partially the acting. So it's that awesome combo. So Barbara, uh, so Jeffrey Combs has been in From Beyond. He was in Pit and, The Pit and the Pendulum, Frighteners, which is underrated, by the way, and see that if you haven't, and Castle Freak. 
Um, Barbara Crampton, also in Castle Freak, also in From Beyond, and also in Chopping Mall. If you haven't seen Chopping Mall, check that out. I actually did a no-spoilers review for Chopping Mall on my channel, so you can check that out before you watch it to make sure you want to watch it. But it's one of those awesome bad movies, but I recommend it. So this was originally actually supposed to be a stage play. Uh, it was written to be a stage play. They ended up not doing that. Uh, it was then written as a TV show pilot, and then I believe it was Brian Usna had kind of said, hey, you know, we can make this, but maybe you want to do it more of like a movie, because in order to get the money that you would need for the practical effects you want to do, um, a movie is a better way to go as opposed to TV, because you wouldn't be able to do all that stuff, all the gore and practical effects on TV anyway. So then they adapted it, um, Stuart Gordon adapt made it into a movie script. Uh, Gordon decided that there were too many vampire films, so he was like, hey, you know what's not getting enough love? Frankenstein-related stuff. So if you go into this film knowing that, or if you think back to this film, the Frankenstein really fits. You can see it. But it's also kind of zombie at the same time with the whole reanimation thing. So I kind of view it as like a meshing of Frankenstein and zombies, although it is way more on the Frankenstein side of it because... I mean, if, if you look at this, the structure of the story and how it plays out, like, it is the story of Frankenstein, in essence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So Stuart Gordon and John Nolan, who did the practical effects, they used forensic pathology books in order to get things right with the dead bodies in this. So if you notice, like, the corpses in the morgue, they look, they're supposed to, like, look very realistic. And one of the big moments that you kind of see that, these little touches of detail is when the first corpse reanimation in the morgue happens and he's attacking West and uh, Kane and you see on his back the lividity. It's like all the redness. That's because when he's like laying on the gurney as a corpse, all the blood kind of like pools at, on his back, in his back because he's laying on his back. And that's, I believe that's called lividity. But um yeah, so they had those touches of, like, we want this to look right because we're doing it in a morgue at a, at a school at Miskatonic University, which is a thing from H.P. Lovecraft. He used Miskatonic as a thing. He also used the city of Arkham in Massachusetts as a city for a lot of his stories, and obviously both those things are very much fictional, Arkham and Miskatonic, but they're throughout his writings. Uh, Nolan used... Um, I think he had said in a film he hadn't used more than like a gallon or two of blood in any film when he was doing his practical effects. He used 24 gallons of blood for this film, so that gives you an idea of how much gore and how much work went into it, by the way. Uh, this originally had an X rating, and they had to cut a bunch from the film to get it down to an R, so it was interesting, because a lot of what they cut, as you would assume, to get it down to the R rating, gore and violence... So they actually added some in to get the runtime a little bit longer, and it was scenes that were cut from the X-rated version. So they added scenes in there where um, the Hill, Dr. Hill, is hypnotizing other people in the, in the film, which if you know that information and you watch it, some things make more sense because with his hypnotizing people... It, it obviously makes him more suggestible to do what he's doing. And in particular, the moment where he shows up in the basement when uh, Herbert West is there and he kind of takes, is like, I'm taking your research from you. And Herbert West, like, looks like he has this moment of, like, being scared by him and then backing down. But what it actually was originally is that it was that hip hypnotizing that was taking effect on him. Or at least to a little part. He may have also been scared because, you know, he's an imposing dude. That guy, David Gale, who played Dr. Hill, looked great in that role. He played evil amazingly. Like, between his looks and his acting, he was great for that role. Loved him as Dr. Hill. The other thing that they, that they added to the R version was there were scenes where Herbert West was giving himself small doses of the serum just to keep himself awake and energized which I feel like they should have left that in there because I think it's kind of a cool little little thing going on. And maybe they should have had that like play a little bit more into it where like he got like a little stronger or something like that. I don't know. So they there were sequels to this film. In uh, 1990, there was Bride of Reanimator. And in 2003, there was Beyond Reanimator. And I will say right now, I have not seen either of those, 
but I definitely want to. They've been on my list to see for quite some time, but I have like over 500 movies on my list to see, so it's kind of hard to get through that, but I'll get there. Okay, so going into the actual movie portion, what an awesome way to start this film. Uh, the freaking out of Dr. Gruber, I think it was his name in Germany, and how his eyes like explode and there's blood all over the place and he's like flipping out. Like you have no context going into it. And that's an amazing moment to just grab you and pull you in. And you're like, what is going on here? This is nuts. I need to know more. I need the backstory on this. And the fact that Herbert West is immediately there so that when he shows up at the school, you're kind of like, oh, I know this guy. And I don't think this is going to go well because he's kind of a bad dude. But it's interesting because they were like, you killed him. And then he's like, no, I gave him life, which just gives you a little uh, teaser of what's to come, of what, you know, what's what's behind all of that and what's going on with Herbert West and his, and his research. The music in this is awesome. It's like upbeat and adventurous, but also kind of like off in like a horror way. And like the main song, I think, which they reuse quite a few times, is very recognizable to me as Reanimator. And I think it, it is a very iconic sounding song and I love it. I love it. It works so well. There's some good foreshadowing in this, especially with the with the security guard who is just like, when they're bringing bodies in early on, it's just like, I don't know why they have locks on this thing because nobody really wants to go in and certainly no one walks out. Foreshadowing, because people will walk out <laughs> as they're reanimated. The other thing to point out about the security guard is later on in the film, he is reading light pornography, basically, while on the job, which... <laughs> I thought was kind of funny that they just threw that in. He has a boudoir magazine, which, you know, I don't think there's necessarily nudity in that magazine. There could have been, but it's kind of like a light porn type thing. It's definitely more porn than looking at a Victoria's Secret catalog. I'll say that. Not like I know, but I do. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's interesting because it's like your opinions of Herbert West and Dr. Hill switch throughout the course of the film. Because immediately, because of the opening scene, like, you feel like Herbert West is a bad guy. You're like, oh, this guy's really terrible news. And then you see Hill, and he's like a teacher. He's a professor at a school. And you immediately just have this feeling like, oh, you know, he's a highly respected guy. He's doing research. He's, you know, and then they start, they show up, and they're having tension between the two of them. So the tension is very well set up. But then as it progresses, you start to realize Herbert West is more complicated than, than you know, what was led on to in the beginning. And so is Dr. Hill. And it, you start to have your view change and you start to see Dr. Hill as more evil and you start to see Dr. West as less evil and they just kind of like cross paths at some point until the very end where it's very clear that Dr. Hill is super e evil and West is not as evil. Although he did some evil stuff, let's be honest. So, well, maybe it's not so much, well, he killed the cat. He killed Rufus. So that was kind of evil. Um, I think he was just so, his character's just supposed to be so blinded to morality and, and humanity because of how focused he is on scientific advances, which kind of speaks to a theme that I want to talk about later, well, at the very end of this review, of how thing, that parallels with actual society of, you know, just going into technological and scientific advances devoid of thinking, should we actually do this? Because that's what is happening with Herbert West throughout this film. He's he's not stopping and thinking, should I actually do this? He's like, I think I can do this. I'm doing this. So yeah. Um, I love, like I said, I love the tension between West and Hill and it's pretty much immediate. And I think it's it's amped up because of the way those two actors are, how they do their roles and how good they are at acting. It just brings a lot to that tension between them. It's a great rivalry. Um, West character is a, a West as a character is an amazing because he's not fully awful. You know, you think he's awful at first and then your opinion of him changes. So you feel very conflicted. Uh, you recognize the good, you recognize the bad, but then he's just because of Jeffrey Combs, he's just a joy to watch because he's very all over the place and you really don't know where he's going to go next. Is he going to do something kind of evil? Is he going to do something kind of good or somewhere in between? You don't know. Um, I love how excited West gets in this when he's he's going to check out the space to live in and he gets like crazy stoked about the creepy basement. 
when most people watching are like, oh, that's a terrible, that I would never want to be down there. He's like, this is amazing. Probably because no one wanted to come down there. Um, you get a really good whiff of Dr. Hill's interest in Megan when they're having, when he's having dinner with Halsey and he kind of questions, oh, should she be with Kane? You know, it, it's, it's got like this hint of kind of jealousy. And obviously that comes into play much later when he's trying to head raper. I don't know. Tongue raper. Oh, that sounds terrible, but that's what was going on. Uh, the cat reanimation scene is extremely important to this film. It's very intense and well done. But at the same time, I don't think it fully holds up now because one part in particular where the fake cat is strapped to Jeffrey Combs' back and he's like flailing around with it, like it looks really fake. It, it looks super fake. But, you know, they can't change that. It was the 80s. It is what it is. Everything else in this film pretty much holds up, though. The bone saw portion through the reanimated body, I think, is awesome. Um, that's the, I, I think that's the first moment in this film past, like, seeing the cat all messed up on, on the table uh, that's really, like, gory and gross and, like, over the top. Uh, so people know, like, okay, here we go. We're, it's this type of movie. We're going to have gore. We're going to have violence. This is where we're going. So that's the kind of first moment that does it. And it was shot well. It looks good. Um, I like how you see the steps of these experiments where he's trying to figure out the freshness of bodies versus the trauma to bodies versus the dosage of the serum. And you get that in a few portions. You get, you know, obviously the reanimated cat. Then you get the corpses in the, in the morgue. And then you get Dean Halsey when he's reanimated. And then you also get Hill, just his head being reanimated. So there are a bunch of trials that you see as an audience member, which I think plays really well. So it's like you're along for the experiments. I think that's good. Um, there's kind of a plot hole in here. When I'm talking about reanimating here, there's there's a bit of a plot hole. So when uh, West kills Hill and he cuts his head off, then he reanimates just his head, but the body reanimates with it. And it's kind of like, it's like mind, the, the power of his mind is controlling the dead body because Hill does or West does not inject serum into the body. And based on the world that was created within this film leading up to this moment, it, it's it's being said that the serum has to be introduced to dead tissue in order for it to be reanimated. So I think it's a plot hole in my opinion that his body is reanimated by his thoughts basically. Unless they're trying to get at some sort of thing of of a uh, like a soul being there, which can control the body from the brain. And as long as the brain is alive, then the body can, you know, can still be there. But I think it's a plot hole. I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense. And that's one of my problems with the film. One of very few. But, um, but you know, when, when the head and the body are separated, it does lead to some really fun and funny moments where... Hill is sometimes frustratingly trying to control his body to do things for him. Uh, I like his facial acting at those moments where he's kind of like, Arr. and he's like, Arr. when the body's like bumping into things, uh, it's a fun time. The story component of being able to pacify the reanimated bodies with a lobotomy, like is done to uh, Dean Halsey by Hill, I think is a really nice touch to the story because that's a it, it's just it's just a further step. You know, you get to the reanimation and you're just like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. It's like Frankenstein, it's like zombies, whatever. But then you take it just a step further and you're like, oh, but you can kind of pacify these Frankenstein monsters or these zombies. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. Uh, the imagery of Hill's head over the reflection of Halsey's head in, uh, through the window when he's in like the loony bin is a really cool moment where it's it's showing the mind control, showing him being switched over so that Hill is is going to be able going forward to control Halsey's uh, actions and reactions. So that's cool. Uh, the molest. So okay, I wrote this about the infamous scene, which people who worked on the film supposedly call the head gives head um molestation is scary enough molestation by a severed head and a headless body has got to be exponentially more scary 
So it's a really gross scene. It's a really creepy, uncomfortable scene. It's scary. It's all of those things. And I think they pulled it off really well. You have to give a lot of props to Barbara Crampton for actually going through with doing a scene like that. Um, I heard an interview with her on the on Mick Garris's postmortem podcast where she was kind of talking about um, how she was on the fence about doing this film because of all the nudity and sexuality to it. And um, in the end, she's just like, hey, you know, it's a scene. It's, you, you know, it's a film. Like, do you want to be an acting or do you not want to be an acting? So good on her for going through with it. I could do it. I could be totally nude, schlong out, no problem for a scene like that in a movie like this because I love it. Not the schlong out, I love it. I just love the movie. It's for creativity, and I'm one of those people who are like, I'll do a lot of things for creativity. Um, it was challenging to shoot the the scenes with Hill as his head was separated from his body, apparently. When I was doing research, I found, I found this out because if you notice when you're watching in different scenes, he's in different positions with his head. Sometimes it's like the head in a pan separate from the body, um, so they have to shoot that a certain way. Then it's like the body holding the head they have to shoot that a certain way so there were uh, apparently it was super super challenging to come up with the different ways in which they were going to shoot this headless body and the severed head together so that had to be tough halsey's humanity is still there because i assume it's because he can still access memories because the brain is there um and obviously we see this in the end where he's been being controlled by hill but then Barbara Crampton's character, Megan, like appeals to it. Like, I'm your daughter. How can you do this? And then it's like there's a switch that hits uh, because he's accessing those memories of like, oh, there it is. There's the humanity. And then he fights him. And I love when he like crushes Hill's head. And not only does he just like crush it, but he just like chucks it out, the, out of the room and it hits the wall and bounces off. And there's like this blood and brain matter, I assume, on the wall. It's just kind of funny. I like it. So, uh, Bride of Reanimator is super fitting as the sequel to this film uh, because of the fact that sticking with the whole Frankenstein thing, there was Frankenstein and there was Bride of Frankenstein. So, very, very fitting. Makes a whole lot of sense. And I love the very end of this film where they go to black and the only thing you see then is the glowing green serum as the syringe compresses and you get the idea, you know, that that serum is going into Megan's body and she will be reanimated. And you're thinking, this is not going to go well. Because at what point did any of this go well? But love will do some crazy things to you, apparently. A lot of people know that. All right, so let's talk about what's going on thematically with some of the stuff, which I said I would get back to. So these characters are all about control. Let's talk about that. West and Hill want to control life and death. Kane gets pulled into that, wanting to control life and death with them. He's kind of more like a lackey. Hill wants to control Megan, and Dean Halsey wants to control Megan and all the students at the school. So there's a lot of people wanting to control things throughout this film, and that's just something that came became apparent to me as I was watching it. Um, this is just like Frankenstein I wrote as it's a cautionary tale of what happens when people try to mess with the natural cycles of life and death. That is exactly what happens in Frankenstein. It is what happens when you want to create a human out of death or bring a human back to life. Uh, never goes well, and it is a direct mirroring of Frankenstein, as we've talked about. Uh, this speaks actually to many things within our society, like I was talking about with like technology and scientific advancements. Just because you think you can do something new or innovate doesn't mean you actually should. And I feel like within society, we have this acceptance of for uh, the advancements of, of science, for the advancement of technology, that private companies are allowed to just do whatever. Like, oh, they're just trying to make money. They're just trying to advance technology or science, whatever. Just do it. Um, and movies like this kind of point out, you know what? That can go very, very wrong. You need to stop, evaluate, maybe do like a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, but no, we just charge ahead with a lot of things and that could lead to some very bad stuff. Because, you know, you see it in this, like West ultimately just wants to bring bodies back. Like he, it's like he's not thinking that far ahead. He's just thinking, we can bring these bodies back. 
just thinking we can bring humans back to life. So, like, there's something good in that. But at the same time, it feels like his focus is more about getting recognition and, like, the glory of, like, I did this. And you see that from Hill as well on his side where he's creating, like, his laser technology at the same time that West is doing his thing with, you know, getting making it easier to lobotomize people, basically. So it's just, they they seem more driven by ego than anything, and that, I feel like, happens a lot with technology and science in our society. Um, probably less with the science aspect, but a lot with the technology portion of it. And then it's like, what are the unintended effects, or the effects that, they sh that people should have thought of, but didn't? We don't know. So that's actually all I had to say about uh, Reanimator. All I had to say, I went, this is like my longest movie review video, so I apologize for that one. Um, oh no, it's not my longest. I think Fright Night may be my longest at the moment, but this is close. Anyway, continuing on. So uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, oh man, it's, it's not a perfect film, but I'm going to go four and a half on this one. I'm going to... It's a four and a half. I'm close. I feel like if I was doing quarters, I would give it the 4.75 because I feel like it's close to a five star, but I'm going four and a half on it. Uh, I really do like this film, obviously. Uh, super cool. Uncle Pete, hopefully you enjoyed this review. Everyone else, uh, put some comments down there. Let's talk. Well, uh, Uncle Pete, I know we'll put comments down there. Everyone else, put some comments down there. Let's talk about your feelings on Reanimator, your ideas of themes, whatever you want. Uh, hit that subscribe for me if you're not already a su subscriber. That's the best way for you to pay me back. It literally takes you a second, and it's totally painless. Costs you no money, but it can mean a lot for my channel, and I appreciate that. But thanks, ultimately, for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.